a master of classical music. In half century, Zubin Mehta has been conducting the world's top orchestras. At a high age of 79, the maestro is still holding on to his baton. Your master carry on one set. Don't get into a routine. I love my life and my music so much. There would have been no problem with me being routine conductor. Even with the same works, same yes, scores, no, with the same look, orchestra. I look forward to it every night. Mehta was born into a musical family in Bombay. His father, Meikli Mehta, a self-taught violinist, founded Bombay's symphony orchestra and was Zubin's primary source of inspiration. After a short period of pre-medical studies in India, Mehta left for Vienna where he studied under Hans Swarovski at 18. By the age of 25, Mehta had already conducted the Vienna, Berlin and Israel Philharmonics. Mehta never spared his effort as a healer through music. He believes that music can bring people together, Arabs, Jews, Hindus and Muslims. It might be very good in that two hours, but again, what's the point of doing that? Maybe they don't go out hand in hand, <laughs> but they hear Beethoven together. Mm. Some good has to be done, because don't underestimate the power of music. Meta is an old friend to Chinese music lovers. Since his first visit to Hong Kong in 1988, Meta has been back almost every year. In 2014, Meta made a tour of nine cities around China. And in early 2015, he returned to conduct the classic opera Aida with the National Center for the Performing Arts. What is the thing that attracts you most? I had a sort of a spiritual connection with my family in India with China. I was always longing to go. Maestro, welcome to ICON, and I should say, welcome back to Beijing again. Thank you. Since uh, 1994, mm. in the past 20 years, you've been back to China almost, well, maybe not every year, but very frequently. Yeah. What is the thing that attracts you most to, you know, to lure you back to China all the time again? Well, I had a sort of a spiritual connection, my family in India with China, because my father's eldest brother was in Shanghai for about 25 years as the director of the cotton industry. And so my grandmother visited him twice in the 30s. And so all my youth growing up, I would hear only about China from my grandmother. Mm. And my house was filled with Chinese antiques and, you know, those ebony screens with the mother of pearl mm. figures. So I grew up with a Chinese atmosphere around me, mm. and uh, I was always longing to go. You had an impression of the country before instance, you even came here. My cousin, who was my uncle's son, mm. as a young boy, when he came to Bombay to visit, he only spoke Shanghainese. <laughs> so I couldn't speak with him. Right, right. In fact, he lives in Michigan now. He still speaks it. You visited Hong Kong in 1988, but the first time to the Chinese mainland was in 1994. So it's been 20 years. Yes. Uh, what, what are the changes you've noticed and that struck you most? <laughs> Everything changed in China. <laughs> well, what, was it, what was it like, say, the first visit? Well, the first visit, I must tell you, there were still thousands of bicycles. There were cars already, but I remember in Shanghai, it was raining and we saw these hundreds of people in the morning going to work on the bicycles with a plastic hood, different colors. It was very poetic. Beautiful in the rain to see these people that you couldn't see their faces, only the green and red and blue plastics. It was a spectrum of color, mm. which was, uh, and the slow movement of the traffic. Mm. was wonderful. And the concert itself? concert was in a small hall, I remember. Mm. That was actually the, one of the government mansion halls actually I saw, the There was about, I think, 600 people. Now Shanghai has opera houses and so many concert halls and no more bicycles. No more bicycles, too many cars actually, <laughs> you know, in big cities. But if you talk about classical uh, music scene in China, what are the major developments you've noticed? Introduction of more 
music schools. This is vital because they will produce the future artists mm. and they are already producing. You know, so many big American orchestras are filled with Chinese musicians that study here first and then they go to America mm. and then they see auditions. I think the Chicago Symphony has about 14 or 15 Chinese musicians in important places, like Concertmaster. Mm. So uh, China is producing a lot. Not to mention... I hope my country will do that one day. Back in India. Yeah. Right. But not to mention there's so many new venues, all these music oh, concert yes. halls. New venues everywhere. For instance, the nine city tour I did, only one city had a hall that was not very good. Other eight all good halls mm -hmm. in Wuhan and uh, Suzhou and, uh, and, every, and then of course Guangzhou, etc. Wonderful. Mm. So, I, and very good hotels. Very good hotels. Very good hotels. This time you are here in China, you're here in Beijing for, the, uh, for AIDA. You're conducting yeah. AIDA. I must time. tell you, this opera house is completely unique. Mm. This is probably the cultural center of China. Uh, NCPA. Yes. In the last seven years, they've done over 40 productions, new productions. This is very ambitious. Mm. And the director here, the president, he's, uh, he has a great vision. He is very proud, he's Mr. Cheng Ping. There are so many different theaters. There are four different halls in here yes, inside yes. the building. The orchestra is very good, improving all the time. Mm. But he, and so I think China should be very proud of this establishment. You're and not new to NCPA because you've conducted before here. Yeah, I conducted in the concert hall with the Vienna Philharmonic, mm. la last year with the uh, Israel Philharmonic also. But this time it's different because you're conducting... At the Opera House. At the Opera House. Yeah, yeah. And this is NCPA's production, Aida. Yeah, absolutely. NCPA itself is new, it's just seven years. Yeah. And NCPA orchestra is even younger, four years old. Yeah. How did it happen? You're now, this time, teaming up with well, NCPA orchestra. Well, it happened because of Cheng Ping. He has the vision and he wants to have a world-class uh, situation here mm -hmm. and he's getting there. And you don't mind working with a young orchestra? No, say? no, no. It is actually, it's a youth orchestra, mm -hmm. almost. And uh, they are technically good. They have no experience. So, and they're learning very fast. They have to learn to play the music and listen to the singers and uh, you know it's not only like in a playing a symphony you play your part and listen to the other musicians but now you have to do that and listen to singers mm. and singers sometimes are not as rhythmically solid as professional uh, orchestral musicians mm. so we have to be flexible with them mm. what is it you treasure most when you know, deciding to work with an orchestra? Is it, you know, the history? Is it the way they present music? Well, what I've been so often in China, and I've been to this wonderful uh, colossus here, this NCPA. So when I was invited, I, it was, I was curious. Uh, it was, of, you know, we are doing plans at least three years before. So three years ago, I had this space in January of 15. I said, okay, I'll go. Mm. And my wife also, she loves China. Mm -hmm. So this was a kind of gift to her right. that she could be such a long time. You, you've conducted AIDA for, I guess, numerous times. You've lost Kang. Uh, is there a best? Is there a favorite? You mean the production? Yes. Oh, absolutely. It's the best production I've ever seen. <laughs> Now we have the advantage of having projections. Oh yes. In the 60s and 70s, they didn't do opera with projection. 
Today, we sit on the seat and we see the whole Nile flowing. And I asked the production manager, I said, can you make the river go the other way? He said, yeah, if you want. That's what you can do with projection. And that with lighting and the, and the hot Egyptian sun, which is blazing on the singers, mm. it's something very new. I've been to Egypt, I've been to Luxor, mm. and the beauty of the Nile is a changing of colors. It's being During reflected the day. in this production. Oh, yes. The Nile has one color in the morning, another in the afternoon. At sunset, it turns to be a dark blue, etc. He's going to do all that. Uh -huh. Now, you've been rehearsing with the orchestra for so many days. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm not an insider, but uh, what, from, from what I hear from insiders, it's not everyone, it's not every conductor works that way. But you said once that you're an old school conductor. What do you mean by that, old school conductor? Well, it means I'm at every rehearsal. Not only the ones I conduct, but I'm also at the director, director's rehearsals. Mm. We have a very fine Italian di stage director, yeah, 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 but I like to be with him and make suggestions because if he places the chorus in a certain way that they won't be able to see me for, I'm just giving you an example, then he's flexible and he turns them and the singers also have to have contact with me plus act. This is not an opera where you just stand and sing. There's a lot of drama going on. Mm. There's a lot of interaction dramatically between the singers. For instance, the two ladies, <clears throat> Aida and Amneris, they both love Radames. <clears throat> There's a great tension between them. So each one tries to find out information from the other. So this grand opera with all the ships and all suddenly becomes a little chamber opera with tension between two people. Mm. Uh, so a lot of scenes are on a small scale, although you see the big stage. And uh, my presence at the rehearsals of the director is very important for me too, that I see exactly what's going on. But with your expertise, with your experience, do you still well, need to do so? Well, I can give a few suggestions, mm. yes. At least, I mean, it is important maybe for them to hear the suggestions from you. But what about for yourself? Is it still important for you to be there? Of course. Of course, because since it's a new production, the, all the, the, the angles are new, mm. the, the stages, the steps are new. I don't know where the chorus is going to be. You know, in the second act, we have over 100 people on stage singing. So they all sit, stand on a flat stage. So we have to build steps so that they all can see, etc. And those things are in evolution in the rehearsal period. And tell me what the working model is like. I mean, you're the conductor. You're like, you know, the leader, the, uh, uh, the, the commander of an army. Well, during the rehearsals of the stage director with piano, I play a second, I say, of a, a back role. Mm. I let him do his work, make some suggestions, etc. If singers make musical mistakes, I correct them. But when there are rehearsals with the orchestra and stage, then I'm in complete command. Maybe most importantly, it should be in tune with your understanding of this yes. production. But that, during the rehearsal, the orchestra is now completely with my conception. Mm. Completely. Uh, uh, they are playing really very beautifully. Uh, what if there are some, you know, frustrations among some musicians when they have different understandings? Well, then we stop and we correct them. <laughs> also... I'm very open to a musician who shows me what he or she can do. Mm. You know, they have a little solo, they play for me, and if I like it, I let them uh, have their musical opinion too. And I guess things were much different when you were young, like say 50 years ago, because now it's, you know, you. Well, I you learned... You sitting there. I, 50 years ago, I learned a lot from very aged, experienced musicians. Mm -hmm. And I always told them, look, I know I'm younger than you, but my door is open. If you have suggestions, please tell me. So they would tell me, believe me. But that happened more in Vienna. I would conduct my teachers. Mm. And then the next generation came in. They were all the students that went to school with me in Vienna. 
Now is the third generation of youngsters uh -huh. that, because my generation already is gone, you know, at 65 they go, they are pensioned. Uh, what would you like to say to the younger generation conductors, say? Basically, I guess they were maybe facing the same pressure as you did maybe 50 something years ago. And what would be the suggestion you would like to offer them? First of all, they have to come prepared. They have to come knowing the score inside out. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't, an orchestra will recognize that immediately. That's why the knowledge of the score is one thing, but the knowledge of the style of the composer is very important. Mm. Because take Beethoven, for instance. Beethoven's early works are stylistically borrowed from Mozart and Haydn. That's what he grew up with. And then this genius, in the middle of his creativity, laid the foundation stone for the Romantic era. Mm. It's like Michelangelo. Michelangelo sculpts the Pietà, which is the height of classical sculpture. Mm. And then with the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, it's the birth of the Baroque. Having known the score very well and your conception, then it's only experience that will tell you how to bring it out of the orchestra. Mm. It won't happen immediately. It's a trial and error uh, profession also. But you must come prepared. If you don't come prepared and the orchestra sees you swimming about, <laughs> then you lose them. Then they'll play by themselves. So then they'll do the best they can. Well, there seemed to be a little game going over there, you know, the, the uh, musicians, the orchestra, and, and the conductor. Well, if they don't respect you, uh, then it's a negative situation. And this happened to me a few times few times and uh, I learned my lesson and I the next time I went really prepared you mean with the Czech uh, Philharmonic Orchestra oh yeah how do you know that well I, I did my homework <laughs> I see. Yeah. that was the only case right well it was an extreme case <laughs> it was the Beethoven Ninth Symphony right I thought I knew the score but I didn't as much as they did mm. and uh, they immediately saw that I'm not, uh, I, that I didn't have a concept that would convince them. Mm. So I took my time. I didn't go back for at least f five, six years. And then I went with two pieces that I really knew well. And everyone was, was happy. Was wonderful, yeah, wonderful. Because they are a great orchestra, the Czech Philharmonic. Is it hard work to convince the orchestra to accept your conception? No, if they see that you have a, a conception which is logic, they go along. Mm. Because they have played the same pieces with many other conductors. So they have to be flexible too. Mm. Maestro, you've been a conductor for decades. You, your master carry on one set to you, if I remember correctly. Be careful, don't get into a routine. Yes. How do, you, how do you manage to avoid well, he repeating me yourself? A, he warned me about America. Mm -hmm. When he heard that I'm going to the Los Angeles Philharmonic, he said, I'm, he said he has never been a music director in America, but please be careful that they play the con so many concerts that you might get into a routine. And I never forgot that advice. But I love my life and my music so much there would have been no problem with me being a, rut a routine conductor. But even with the same works, same yes, scores, no, with the look, same orchestra? I look forward to it every night. And with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, it was not easy because we would go out of town and play it li in little school auditoriums with a terrible acoustic. But we would still play Brahms's Fourth Symphony mm -hmm. or Dvorak's New World mm. and... I gave them my best because sometimes they would see the auditorium and not be in the mood to make music because the musician has to be inspired. But I would do my best to inspire them.
we talk actually about your music, but at the same time, we understand you believe very much in the power of music, not just in concert halls, and that's why you you put in your efforts in bringing musicians from Germany and Israel Israel together to share one stage. Yes, you well, that was symbolically very important mm. that the Germans and the Jews play together. And it worked beautifully because musicians are musicians. They just love to play next to each other. Mm. There was no animosity. Very important, what I did two years ago now, I took the Munich Opera Orchestra to Kashmir. Kashmir is a place where for the last 60 years there has been animosity between mm -hmm. Hindus and Muslims. Well, and it was my dream in my country mm -hmm. to play for Muslims and Hindus sitting together. And it happened. And there, there were a lot of objections from Islamist uh, Muslims in Kashmir. They didn't want the concert to happen. And we, the Indian government supported me. The German government, also who was responsible for bringing the German orchestra, they raised money to the, uh, and the Kashmiri government was completely on our side. Mm. And uh, it was only symbolic. But for two hours, Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir heard music sitting together. And that was very healing. And now they are fighting again, last week, <laughs> between Pakistan and India. It says, seems to be no quiet. That's why some critics would say, well, it might be very good. It might, it might be very good in that two hours, but again, what's the point of doing that? Point is symbolic. Point is that music makes people smile at each other. I do that in Israel too. Arabs and Jews come to my concerts. Mm -hmm and they sit together. Maybe they don't go out hand in hand, <laughs> but they hear Beethoven together. Mm. Some good has to be done, because don't underestimate the power of music. Under your pattern, you've united the three tenors. <laughs> that's different. On, on, on this, that's, that's different, different. different story, <laughs> but again. So is it the power of music, or is it the power of your influence, personally? No, but look, you mentioned the three tenors. The three tenors concert, without us wanting it, suddenly brought opera to millions who had never known it before. Millions of young people hearing this concert and buying the recording started going to operas. Mm. So it did some good, but we didn't do the concert for that reason. We, were, we just, three friends got together mm. the night before the World Cup finals. Mm and they wanted to do a concert, so we did it, but... Uh, but it was so phenomenal. Yes, the, the result was something we didn't expect. No. And the record sold, to, I think, 20 million. This for classical music is unheard of. For the pop, it's nothing.
you mentioned in your autobiography your desires to conduct Brahms for symphonies. M my question is, out of my curiosity, as a conductor who's been on that stage on the, for, for so many years, do you, do you have a dream lineup of musicians in orchestra scene? You mean the dream team? Yes. Not really, because <laughs> the great orchestras of the world are basically all dream teams. Mm. All of them. Mm. The Berlin, the New York, uh, the Chicago, uh, Vienna Philharmonic. Mm. They are made out of the best musicians of that area. Mm. And in America, there's, as I said, there's a great influx of the, of the Orient. Mm. There are Chinese, Korean, and Japanese musicians in all American orchestras. Mm. Back in China, with Chinese musicians, do you have maybe a list of the Chinese musicians in your mind? Well, I wish some of the Chinese would come back to China. And you've been so busy, you've been traveling, flying all over the world. What about your families? And do they complain about that? Of course they do. <laughs> what do you do about that? Well, no. <laughs> when my children were young, I took every year a month off and we would go on very adventurous vacations. Right. They will never forget those vacations. Right. In Africa and the Amazon. And my wife is an expert on unusual vacations. So she took me to the Antarctic many years ago. It was an adventure to wonderful, you. Wonderful, wonderful. I just actually came back from Antarctica myself. Yes, isn't it terrific? It's so surreal. One of the most beautiful vacations of my life. Right. To see the icebergs and the penguins and, and the albatross. Absolutely. Well, once again, Maestro, thank you for your time and thank all, you the, very all much. the best of wishes. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> right. Thank you.